contempt. <laughs> we say it kind of sounds like a letdown, but we're going to get into it tonight. We're in the midst of our of our dollars and cents series, and last week we gave you guys a whole bunch of principles that really help apply scripture to our lives and how we manage our finances. And the truth is, scripture gives us lots of principles, lots of principles about how to manage money, how to save money, how to invest money, and how to live financially successful lives. Now, I don't know if you've come across this scripture yet, but one of my favorite scriptures in the whole New Testament and all the Gospels is where Jesus says this. Jesus himself said, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. And when Jesus says that, it, it helps shine a light on the way we treat our treasure. If we're really honest with ourselves in here tonight, we would have to admit that wherever our treasure is, it's got a big piece of our heart there with it, doesn't it? We're wanting to invest our treasure wherever our heart goes, and wherever our treasure goes, our heart is soon to follow. And so when Jesus connects this idea of treasure and our heart, when he connects those two things, it helps us to realize that our treasure is actually a heart issue, it's actually a faith issue, and it's instructive to me. It's instructive to me as a pastor because my role as a pastor, as a, as a leader for our church, is to care about the hearts of our people. Amen? And Jesus tells us that means caring about our treasure. You know, one thing I've realized in life is when you're in a financial storm, your heart is bearing burden, isn't it? And when you are financially overflowing, your heart is full of joy in that moment, too, because our treasure is actually a heart issue. And one of the things we're going to see tonight is that contentment as it relates to our treasure is God's desire for our lives. You know, one principle that the Bible teaches that we're gonna zero in on tonight is the principle is the law of contentment. The fact that we will never experience financial freedom if our yearnings exceed our earnings. Do you understand what that means? If you're always wanting more than you have the means to have, you are always gonna be headed for a mess. You're always gonna be headed for a financial storm in your life. Now, I had an experience very early in my faith that I feel is really instructive for us. When we talk about contentment, a lot of folks go through life hoping to one day find contentment, hoping to stumble upon contentment. It's like that old U2 song, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Y'all know the one, right? And there's a lot of people in this world today, maybe some in this room, who still haven't found what they're looking for. You've been looking high, you've been looking low, you can't find whatever it is you're looking for. That contentment continues to escape. You cannot tell you tonight, and hopefully this is going to set you free. Contentment is not something that you find. Contentment is a decision that you make. Contentment is an attitude that you hold on to. I heard of a young man who... Uh, he had a yearning for knowledge. He had a yearning for money. And he was a good Christian young man. So one day he was praying and God answered him back. He was praying, asking God some questions. And God answered him back. He said, God, I have two questions for you. First, what is a million years like to you? And God said, well, to me, I'm the beginning and the end. I was here before creation. I'll, I'll be here forever. So to me, of that, a million years might as well be one second. It's, it's not much. It's it's just a drop in the bucket. And he said, well, my second question is this. If a million years is like a second to you, what's a million dollars like to you? And the Lord said, well, you know scripture, you know, everything in creation is mine. All the cattle on a thousand hills, a million years, a million dollars is really no more than, than one penny. And so the young man said, wow, God, if, 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 if a million dollars is like one penny to you, can I, can I have a penny, please? The Lord responded, sure, son, just wait one second. Just a second. All right, we're good, we're good, we're good. So let's, let's talk about this. You know, if, if you're in a financial storm or you've ever been in a financial storm, number one, you know that's one storm you never will encounter in your life. And if we're really honest, sometimes these financial storms, they're not under your control, and there are circumstances that come up completely outside of your control. Some of our financial storms are like that. They happen to you, there's very low you can do to predict them, and maybe they can overwhelm even your ability to prepare for them. That happens sometimes. But then a lot of financial storms are actually storms of our own making. And, and if you've ever been in that position where creditors are calling you on the telephone, or you're having to ask others for help, I want to tell you, there are lots of 
plans and strategies that we can give you to get out of those situations. And we're going to get into more of where the, where, where, how, how the nuts and bolts work next week. But, but I want to tell you that before you start implementing plans and strategies, it's really a matter of the heart. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. It starts with the heart attitude of contentment. It starts with deciding to no longer allow our yearnings to exceed our earnings. I want to start with a short passage of scripture for you tonight. And this is in your outline, but feel free to look it up on your smartphone as well. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, Paul has, has written a letter, a letter to Timothy. And Timothy is like the son to Paul. He's He's a, a young man that Paul has mentored for many, many years. And, and so he's writing him instructions in this book of 1 Timothy. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul writes this. He says, true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. I need to say that again. True godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Paul's advice to young Timothy is, whether you have much, whether you have little, always be content. When you're content, you'll always have enough. When you're content, you'll be the wealthiest person. You know, now I want you to think about this. I don't know if you've been looking at the calendar, but right now we're about one month away from Black Friday. And all you shopaholics are like, you, you, you feed them. You're looking at the calendar, you got a circle. You can't wait to go out after Thanksgiving and get the deals. We're, we're one month from Black Friday. But I want you to understand what that represents, not just to you, the shopper, the consumer. I want you to understand what it means to the businesses that you'll be supporting. Do you realize most businesses spend the entire year up to this point in the red operating at a deficit? Black Friday is what gets them into the black. Black Friday is what starts putting money in their pockets. I want you to start thinking about it from their perspective. And, 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 and think about think about you. This. They, they will do anything they can to keep you from being content. They will show you the great deals. They will make you feel like you're missing out if you don't get that deal from them, right? Consider this. A recent survey found that the average American will spend about $752 on Christmas. That's a lot of money. $752. Let me ask you two questions. Number one. If you haven't saved up $752 for Christmas already, where is it going to come from? Probably a swipe of credit card, cha-ching, right? Maybe let a bill go unpaid and hope somehow, some kind of way, enough Christmas gifts come in where you could pay that bill or something. I, I, I don't know. How are you going to get that money if you're going to spend it coming up? Number two, who do you think most wants your $752 this Christmas? Is it the people who's going to be receiving your gifts? Or is it the people at the business? Walmart. Someone said Walmart. That's that's a true statement back there. Walmart, Amazon, all of them want to get a hold on your $752 this Christmas. Understand this. The goal of businesses, the goal of marketing, the goal of every commercial, every advertisement you see is to separate you from your money. It causes us to spend more. And most of the time, they don't care at all about your financial health or your stability. For a lot of folks, a financial storm is fixing to come for them. And it may be January, February, or March before you find your way out of it. So we do messages like this to warn you. But I also want to tell you, if you're in a financial storm, that's just the symptom of a bigger illness. Very often, bigger illnesses act that we are addicted to spend. And the vaccine is content. You hear me tonight? The way to vaccinate yourself Overspending, letting your yearnings exceed your earnings is to adopt the value, to adopt the attitude of contentment. And Paul's message to Timothy is this. If, if, if we will mix godliness with contentment, we will experience true wealth in our lives. So tonight we're going to ask this question. What are some of the steps to living by the law of contentment? And as you look at your outline, there are two major things we're going to talk about tonight. Number one, living by the law of contentment requires understanding the problems that discontentment brings into our lives. And so the first thing you want to do is you want to get a hold, you want to understand the problems that discontentment brings into our lives. Paul told the Ephesians, let there be no sexual immorality among you. We can agree, that's a bad thing. Let there be no impurity among you. We can agree, that's a bad thing. And he goes on to say, let there be no greed among you. You may want to underline that word greed. 
our sins, having to face among God's people. What we need to combat, especially at this point in our calendar, is we need to combat the attitude of greed in our lives. In order to do that, let's talk about some things that discontentment brings into our lives. Discontentment causes us to experience more exhaustion in our lives. Isn't that true? Anyone just feel exhausted from running the rat race and trying to keep up with the Joneses sometimes? It's exhausting. This contentment adds exhaustion for a lot. A lot of people stay tired all the time because they're overworking or because they're always scheming, always planning, always trying to find a way to get more dollar bills in the bank account. Ecclesiastes, the author of Ecclesiastes asks, what's the point of having wealth if you're too tired or if you're too dead to spend it all and enjoy it? The author and philosopher Tolstoy, he, he told a story a hundred years ago was of a peasant whose master said, I will give you as much land for you to keep as you can walk around in one day. If I told you I have so much land, I'll give you all the land you can walk around in one day. What would you do? You'd like to attach rockets to your shoes or something. You'd be finding a way to cover as much ground as you could. And that's what he did. The servant, he went out, he ran as fast as he could, as hard as he could, as far as he could. And as the story goes on, written by Tolstoy, he ended up dying of exhaustion. Too tired to actually receive joy in the land that he was coming for. Make sure that this contentment doesn't make you too exhausted to actually enjoy the fruits of your labor. This contentment causes us to it also causes us to experience expenses in our lives. This contentment brings expenses into our lives. The author of Ecclesiastes says the more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. Don't you know that's true? Don't you know that if you inherited a million dollars, all of a sudden you get 30 phone calls from 30 family members you didn't even know you had, right? They would be coming out the woodwork trying to get their hands on that. That's the way it works. The more you have, the more people come help and spend it. So what is the advantage of wealth? Except perhaps to watch it run through your fingers. So if you're someone who likes watching everything slip away from you, then lots and lots of wealth could be a good thing for your future. But the thing about this, you might think to yourself, you know what? Sometimes I get tired of my house. Sometimes my house feels too small. Sometimes with me, my wife, and three kids, there isn't a single solitary, silent place in the house. I'm not, I'm not saying that's my life. Maybe you're thinking that. It's kind of my life too. You might think to yourself, I'd like a bigger house. I'd like a house that's big enough to host company. Ladies, I'd like to have a walk-in closet with one wall for my shoes and like an extra sitting room where I can sit down and look at my shoes. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all have seen this episode of House Hunters, right? What happens? You get the bigger house, your heating bill just went up, your air conditioning bill just went up, you gotta pay someone to come clean it, or you gotta take an extra day out of your life to do all the cleaning. Maybe get yourself a nice nice house with a pool in the back, but then you gotta pay someone to take care of it. You see how, see how the more you have, actually the more expensive it becomes? All right, so that's one reason to not be discontent either. Another, another thing discontentment brings into our lives is anxiety. Anxiety. Ecclesiastes says people work hard, people who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much, but the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. Why that is? Someone put Biggie Smalls back there. Biggie Smalls ain't to the next place. Ah, it's Biggie Smalls who said more money, more problems, right? And we'll go ahead and treat it all as the same. Yeah, yeah, you have more money, it adds more things to worry about. Think about this. People with lots of money worry about how to save it. They worry about how to invest it. They worry about how to keep it. They worry about avoiding paying taxes on it. When I think about all the cartoons I watched growing up as a kid, you know who's the most miserable cartoon character I ever saw? Scrooge McDuck. That dude had a vault of money so big you could swim in it. Man, I wanted to swim in some money when I was a kid. I had no idea it was physically impossible. <laughs> I would think to myself, you know, I would be completely happy if I ever had a vault full of money, not screwed picked up. He was always worried someone was going to break into that vault. He was always worried someone was going to come along and swindle him. He was the most miserable cartoon character I can even remember. Listen, discontentment, it brings anxiety into our lives. It also brings trouble into our lives. Like the Apostle Biggie Small says, no money, no problems. Paul told Timothy this, he said, people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that 
plunge them in ruin and destruction. Some people craving money have won them from the faith. I've met a lot of people craving money have won them from the faith. I've met a lot of people who turn their back on a calling from God because another job paid them. I've met, I've met a lot of people who turn their back on God because they felt like they needed to get a paycheck and God didn't like the place they were getting the paycheck from. Listen, we cannot let money control our lives. Discontentment also adds dissatisfaction to our lives. Ecclesiastes says, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. You know, elsewhere, the author of Ecclesiastes, he described this meaningly, meaningless stuff as chasing after the wind. You ever tried chasing after the wind before? Maybe. You ever caught it? I don't think so, right? Like, what do you got to do? You're going to get a bottle and put the wind in there and cap it up and cure it. It's a jar full of wind. No, it doesn't work that way. You can't ever catch the wind. And, and, and really, when you're not content, when you're yearning, you're exceeding your earnings, when you're always chasing more, 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 when you still haven't found what you're looking for, it's like chasing after the wind. You'll never find it. It brings dissatisfaction in your life. I, I just I just want to tell you, I've been here. I've been here. I remember shortly after we got married in 2005, Tam started her first ever real job as a full-time teacher, making big-time teacher salary. Woo! We thought we were rich. We were a thousandaire. Yes! We could move up from the dollar menu to the value menu at McDonald's. That's how you know you hit a big time. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I, was, I, was, I was still in seminary and, and working maintenance at the church. And, you know, but we, we had what we did the first time ever. It's like, we're adults here. We had minimal expenses. You know, we didn't get into debt, but everything kept slipping through our fingers. Whatever money we made, we found ways to spend it. We like going out to eat at restaurants. I mean, back in the day, when, when you wanted to watch a movie, you still had to drive down the street and go to Blockbuster. Man, we tore Blockbuster up, you know? Between eating out and Blockbuster, we went through everything we had. In 2005, we did our taxes. We found out we owed the government. $800. That's more money than I owe to anyone at that point in my life ever. And I remember hearing that and just my whole life just feel like it had been blown apart. I realized we didn't have $800 in the bank account. Where are we going to find $800 to pay our taxes? And we decided that day we didn't ever want to feel that way again. We didn't ever want to get a bill or something like that that would just blow up whole lives. We found, we found ourselves with trouble, we found ourselves with anxiety, we found ourselves with expenses, and that was, that was a turning point in our lives. We decided at that moment, never again. So the truth is, we went back to eat off the dollar menu. And, and honestly, even that was a little too extravagant for us trying to save up the $800 for taxes. We ate beans and rice for like two weeks straight. And after two weeks straight, we got tired of beans and rice, and we switched over to rice and beans. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's what it took. Let me just encourage you. You don't have to be discontent. You can escape the problems that this brings into your lives. Living by the law of contentment requires understanding the problems that this contentment brings. It also requires living by some principles that enhance our lives. Whatever I have. And so tonight we're going to give you some of the secrets of contentment. What are the secrets to contentment? Number one, we'll learn to be content when we stop comparing ourselves to others. We'll learn to be content when we stop comparing ourselves to others. You gotta remember, the Lord, the Lord created each of us as unique individuals. It is not always God's plan for you to have as nice a car or nicer than your neighbor. It is not always God's plan for you to have as nice a house or nicer than your neighbor. It is not always God's plan for us to have the latest, greatest gizmos and gadgets in our lives. How many of y'all besides me you got a smartphone? Hold up, let, 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 me, let me see your smartphone. Come on, almost everyone's got a smartphone today, right? I remember back in 2001, <laughs> I got my first cell phone. It was one of them Nokia's, you know what I'm talking about? You put it on the charger Sunday night, it's still going strong Wednesday morning. Man, those were the days, right? I, I thought, it, man, you could make phone calls, and you can text people, and it came with a game. It came with snake, and you can make the snake keep getting longer and longer. Best game in the history of cell phones, right? And then the iPhone came along and ruined us all. iPhone came out, whoa, this does, this does so much. How many of y'all admit, 
how many of y'all forgot that your phone actually makes phone calls these days? Because it's got so much other cool stuff on it, right? iPhone came out, whoo, this is amazing. Then something really amazing happened. The iPhone 2 came out, and everybody threw their iPhone 1 in the river. Then came the iPhone 3, the iPhone 4, the iPhone 5, the iPhone 6, the iPhone 7, now the iPhone 8. I Googled the iPhone 8 to see how much it costs. You know the cheapest I could find an iPhone 8? $800. I had no idea that's what the 8 stood for. It's iPhone $800 is what it is. Most of them, $1,000. Let me just say, if you're going after the iPhone 8, you probably struggle with contentment in your life. Can we agree on that? Listen, we got to stop trying to have the latest, greatest things. we got to stop comparing ourselves to See, I know how this, I remember what I thought the first time I even saw an iPhone Plus. Y'all know what the iPhone Plus is? It's the big, gigantic iPhone. I saw an iPhone Plus, I thought, that's the smallest iPad I've ever seen. It. Every time they come out with a newer, bigger, better phone, you think, I need one of those. Every time they come out with a new car, now they got the cars that heat your seats. They heat your drink cup. I've seen they got a car coming out that'll make you a glass of water. I wouldn't drink it. <laughs> I'm paranoid. <laughs> I wouldn't drink it. Listen, we got to give up our search for the latest and greatest. Can I just tell you what, what Paul said? Paul, Paul told the Corinthians, we wouldn't dare say that we're as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are, but they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant. Paul's words on comparing yourself to other people, Paul's words is ignorant. It's not the right standard. You always get in trouble when you compare yourself to others without learning how to admire, without having to acquire in our lives. Listen, we've got to remember that comparison always robs us of contentment. Amen? Gotta stop comparing ourselves to others. We also gotta strive to enjoy what we have. You gotta enjoy what we have. You think you need yourself? Man, that doesn't sound like a church message. That's not painful enough, Pastor. No, it doesn't always have to be painful. Yes, following Jesus is picking up your cross daily and following Him. But we've also gotta recognize that not everything in our lives is intended to be some grueling challenge. Some of the things that we have in our lives, we have to admit, are there through the authority and the will of God. Some of the good things, some of the blessings, the Bible says every good and perfect gift is from the Father of lights above. God has not called us to be monks who deprive ourselves of any kind of one thing or good thing, as long as it's within the will of God, the plan for your life. See, people often don't enjoy what they already have because they're always going after more, and that's what we're looking to avoid, is the golden after war, called ultimately. They're trusting in God who richly gives all we need for our enjoyment. Underline that word enjoyment. For our enjoyment, God has given you gifts. He has given you blessings so that you would enjoy them. It's okay to enjoy the things that God gives you. Ecclesiastes says, it's a good thing to receive wealth from God and the good health to enjoy it, to enjoy your work and accept your lot in life. This indeed is a gift from God. I feel like this is one of those principles that my wife and I just kind of backed into by accident. When we were much younger in our, our lives, and when we were younger parents with young children, we kind of stumbled upon brilliance a few years ago. Maybe y'all are like me. We used, to, we used to want to give our kids the world for Christmas, you know? We want our kids to get up and go look at the Christmas tree and be so shocked that they literally explode right there in front of you. That's kind of what we were going for. And, and so the first couple of Christmases, all three of our kids, and I couldn't even count the number of presents we had under the tree. Some of them big, some of them little, but that was like our yearnings were exceeding our earnings. You know, we, we, we spent money we didn't have at the time putting it into to their Christmas. And, and so maybe your experience has been like mine, but, but you give your kids a gift and they go ape over it. A week later, where is it? I don't know. You don't know. They don't know. They have no idea what happened to it. They're like, wait, what did you give me for Christmas? How long ago was that? It's, it's hard as a parent. As a parent, you feel like this is your time. 
This is your time. There's, there's 365 days out of the year. This is the one day you use to make up for the other 364. You know what I'm talking about? Where you're like, man, I carry all this guilt. I wish I had done it better. I completely screwed up this situation, but I'm making it up come Christmas. There's that temptation to do that. And what we realize is that most of our kids, they're just not go sit in the room, play with the toys. They get the toys, they neglect us, or get broken or get tossed under a bed for all of eternity until you have to move the bed and then you find all sorts of great things in the We decided though, if they're not that into toys, we're gonna, we're gonna give them a cat. We're gonna give them a free toy cat at Christmas. All right, we'll get, we'll get you free things, kid. They'll be kind of cool. Or we'll get you free things. We are not cluttering up our house full of junk. And if they don't enjoy what they have, why would we get them more? We don't enjoy what we have. Why would God give us more? Are you with me? Some of you guys, you got some free cool things. Free cool things. It's okay to enjoy. In fact, it's true. We need to. That's one of the ways we, we keep discontentment on its heels and keep it from into our lives. Another thing we need to do, we need to seek to remember that life is not about things. Some of y'all, some of y'all, I was telling you, I'm not giving I'm a bad parent. In my defense, let me say some things real quick. Those guys think I'm a bad parent for not getting my kids sons and boys. It's part of the cool for all shit we're from making money. Away from collecting stuff to building memories. You know what I'm saying? My, my, my son Caleb, bless his heart. He loves this army airplane that, that he got for Christmas. Last year, I love it too. I love it when he's not playing with it. I go in there, I play with it too. It's a great <laughs> but in 20 years, I doubt he's going to remember that airplane. I feel like it's my job as a parent to give them experiences that they will remember for a lifetime. That's what we need to do. We need to seek to remember that life is not about things. Jesus said, Beware, war against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Okay, so what's it measured by? Life is measured by your relationships. Life is measured by your relationship with the Lord first and foremost. Life is measured by your relationship with others. This is an old anecdote you probably heard, it, but as a pastor, I've been in the room with people at their last months. I've been with families and watching your loved ones pass on. And to a man, not a single one has ever asked to have their stuff. Some of them wanted to go out with their LSU shirt on, and I guess that's okay, but, but all of them are <laughs> Life is not measured by what we think. It's measured by your relationship with the Lord. It's measured by your relationship with the others. The final thing we've got to do is steadfastly focus on that. This is why relationships are so important. There is nothing in your life that is eternal, that is everlasting, except for people. There are two things that are never going to pass away. The Word of God and people. You recognize that? You recognize that every person in this room has an eternal hope. And depending on what you do with Jesus determines where that eternal home is. But don't doubt the fact that every person here, every person in creation, will have an eternal life. And so it's imperative that what we do with our lives is pushing people to an eternity spent with God as opposed to an eternity separated from God. Amen? And this is really important stuff. If we're going to be content, what's the focus? What's the object of our contentment? How are we leveraging that contentment? When we're focusing on the things that will last forever. When we're pouring ourselves out to make sure our friends, our family members get to go to heaven with us. When we're pouring ourselves out to make sure the other people of our community who need Jesus as badly as we did get to go to heaven as well. As Kobe and some of our worship team come, I want to share one last scripture with you. Paul wrote this in he said this, he said, I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ gives me strength. My question to you is, you say the same about your own. You learn the secret of being content, whether you have little or have this evening, I want you to 
bow your heads and, and close your eyes for just a moment. We enter into a time of prayer. As you came here tonight, there might have been some things that were getting under your skin. There might have been some things that had you feeling discontent. There may be some yearnings in the back of your mind as you're thinking about going into the holiday season and buying presents for people. I want to ask you tonight, are your yearnings exceeding your earnings? Because if they are, that's a miserable place to be. It's a discontented place to be. It's a place that's full of anxiety, it's full of trouble, it's full of exhaustion, it's full of dissatisfaction. The only way to avoid it is to decide to be satisfied with what the Lord has given you. And so tonight, I just want to pray for everyone here that we can decide to be satisfied. Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that every good and perfect gift we have is from you. Lord, we thank you that you have provided for every single need that we have. Lord, we thank you that by most standards, we live a very prosperous life in a very prosperous nation. Lord, we also recognize that we are surrounded by temptation. The temptation to desire, the temptation to acquire, the temptation to make choices that compromise our health and our future in order to feed this discontent. So Lord, we ask you to have your way in us tonight. Renew our minds and renew our hearts. Tonight we decide to be content with what you give, with all that you give and how you give. So, Lord, tonight we place ourselves squarely in your hands. We ask you to fill our hearts with a sense of peace, with a sense of contentment, Lord. And help us to live our lives, abiding by these principles. Help us to live our lives, focusing on what's eternal. Help us to stop comparing ourselves to others. Help us to remember that life is not about things. And help us to enjoy the good gifts that you have given us. Let us be good stewards of the life you've given in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tonight, as we worship, we want you to stand right where you are. Some of our prayer leaders are going to be coming forward.